John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And the more I studied this, the more I liked it. Um, <clears throat> we, we went through John 19 and um, we dealt with the fulfillment of Scripture and so on. And I, and, and I love that. Uh, what we what we've looked at in John 19 as far as the uh, fulfillment of the Word of God. Um, how Jesus said, I thirst, and they gave him vinegar to drink, and that was fulfilled in Scripture, or that was fulfilling Scripture. The fact that he said, it is finished. And uh, you see in James, lust when it conceived, bringeth forth sin. Sin when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And when Jesus said, it is finished, he bowed his head, gave up the ghost. And um, the fact that the Roman soldiers there in verse... Um, Let's see here, verses 32, 33, they were breaking the, the other men who were crucified, they were breaking their legs to hasten their death. And by the time they got to Jesus, they didn't break his legs. That also was a fulfillment of Scripture. Not a bone of him shall be broken. And, um, and I like in verse 35 there of, of chapter 19, he that saw it bear record. And his record is true. That is John's signature. That's how he, he's always talking about bearing witness or bearing record. And, um, and his record is true. And um, whenever you have, whenever you deal with people and you deal with them on a daily basis and they get to know you, the more you tell the truth, better off you're going to be. They will then learn to like you, learn to appreciate you, uh, to want to be around you because they know that you are going to be a truth teller, that you are, uh, e even if the truth is unpopular, uh, we can do what the Bible says, we speak the truth, but we do it in love. Speaking the truth in love. You can speak the truth and hate somebody with it. You can use the truth as a club or a sword uh, to hurt people's feelings. Um, you know, your wife may say, honey, how you like this dress on me? And the husband, if he doesn't love his wife, he's, he would say things like, well, you look fat in it, to be honest with you. Why don't you lose a few pounds? Don't do that. <clears throat> that, you might be telling the truth, but you used it as a club to beat up somebody you're supposed to love. And um, so anyway, just I, I like that. I like that about John, that he saw it with his own eyes. He wrote out the record of it. And he is sort of putting his signature on a legal document saying, this is my testimony. And uh, has anybody ever filled out a police report? I did one night. Uh, we went over here after church one night to get gas at Walmart. And uh, I got out, was filling the pump up, and there was a car pulled in next to us. And there was um, two younger men, and one younger than the other. And the older of the two got the youngest one out and commenced a beating on him. And I stood there and watched that, and I had my hand on my side because I didn't know what was going to happen and uh, that made me mad and I just kind of peeked over and got their their license plate number and I got in my car and I called Festus Police Department and I said you guys need to come over here there's a guy beating another guy up and I don't like it and uh, you know part of me wanted to get involved not a good idea probably but anyway, uh, I filled out a police report, and lo and behold, uh, those two guys had been part of something else that the city of Festus, the police department, was looking for them. And uh, I think eventually they caught up with them. Uh, but anyway, I filled out a police report. I wrote down what I saw, only what I saw, only what I heard, uh, and what I knew. And I signed my name to that. It's a felony to fill out 
a false police report, not wanting to be guilty of a felony. I told exactly what I saw. And that's what John is doing here. Uh, he that saw it bear record and his record is true. He that, and he knoweth that he saith true that you might believe. And uh, I like that. But anyway, <clears throat> moving past uh, John chapter 19, verse 40, they took the body of Jesus. They, <clears throat> and this is important because we're going to deal with this tonight. They wound it in linen clothes with spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. The place uh, where he is crucified, there was a garden and in the garden a new sepulchre wherein he ne was never a man laid yet, yet laid. There uh, laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulchre was nigh at hand. Now, chapter 20, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to bless uh, the testimony of his word tonight and uh, teach us great and mighty things that even babies want to know about. All right. Father, we love you and we thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the program our children put on this morning. Lord, it was a, it was a joy to watch it. And I thank you, Lord, for uh, giving us the ability to pass down to a younger generation the gospel of Jesus Christ, the coming of Jesus to this world, uh, born in Bethlehem, born as a Jew. Father, we just thank you, God, for that. We ask you, Lord, to bless these young people all the days of their lives with that same gospel message. And Father, Lord, open up your word to us tonight. Uh, and I pray, dear God, that uh, what I teach would be acceptable in thy sight. Lord, that it would be understood by your people, both young and old. And I believe, Father, that in these young people's hearts, they, they can hear and, and understand at least a portion of what's being said. And I pray, Lord, that you would instill it in their heart, that it would not ever leave them, and that when they are old, they will not depart from it. So bless your word tonight in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name, and amen. Now... <clears throat> The first day of the week, uh, I think hitting that high G threw my voice out. Now, I can still hit the notes, but there's a price to pay afterward. Um, chapter 20, verse 1, the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, and um, when it was yet dark, under the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Now... Uh, who was Mary Magdalene to Jesus? Who was she? She like his cousin, his girlfriend. That's what the Da Vinci Code was teaching. And believe it or not, I mean, when the Da Vinci Code came out, for some reason it just grabbed people's attention. I don't know why exactly. But then, you know, the History Channel and Discovery Channel, they're doing all these programs on... The Da Vinci Code, was it true? Was there a priory of Zion? This and that and the other. Did Jesus actually marry Mary Magdalene? And so I started researching that. And believe it or not, uh, even though I don't think some of the things that Dan Brown claimed in that book were actually true. Um, and I think he used some artistic license. Believe it or not, there are quite a few people, especially in Europe, that believe before the Da Vinci Code, that Jesus had and some form of relationship with Mary Magdalene, uh, and that there is a there is an entire history that uh, can be told uh, a relationship that uh, Jesus did actually take Mary Magdalene to be his wife in secret, that she was like the thirteenth disciple. Um, and that Jesus would share the secret doctrines with Mary Magdalene, but he wouldn't teach them to Peter, James, John, and the others. And this made the other disciples jealous. Um, there is actually a gospel according to Mary Magdalene. Now, it's got some places in the papyrus that's got holes in it, and it's some of the key words are missing, like, there is a part in there that says that um, Peter and the other disciples, like I said, were jealous of Mary. And uh, because Jesus would often take her with him and that 
um, they would always see Jesus kissing her on the, and then there's a hole in the text. <laughs> you don't know what it says there. So certain scholars have added the word mouth there, but we don't know if it was there because there's, a, there's a, literally a hole in the paper in that spot. But the assumption was that Jesus and Mary had this thing going on. There was a, who made this movie? Back in the late 80s, I believe. Uh, the Last Temptation of Christ. You remember that? Made big news all across the country because it was like blasphemy to us Christians that Jesus was lusting after Mary Magdalene. That was what was in the movie. Willem Dafoe played Jesus. Of all the guys in the world to play Jesus, Willem Dafoe does not belong playing Jesus. But anyway, he made this movie, and, and of course the Christian community got upset, and so on and so on. But then you have these people who actually believe that Jesus and Mary Magdalene fathered a child. The child was a girl named Sarah. And that after Jesus' death, Mary Magdalene and Sarah had to escape uh, Jerusalem. And so they went by boat and landed, uh, I think, in uh, France, on the coast of France. This would be right around the time of Jesus' death. And that all through southern France, you have these Catholic churches that commemorate Mary Magdalene. One of them... Uh, of which is linked with the Knights Templar. But I will get off of that. But anyway, Mary Magdalene was not Jesus' wife. And we know that because, number one, the Bible never says anything about it. Not even a hint about it. Number two, if Mary Magdalene was Jesus' actual wife, Jesus then would be disqualified... From A, either calling the church to be his bride, or B, it would disqualify Jesus from being the chief bishop. Because that's what the Bible calls him. Because the qualifications for a bishop is, he used to be the husband of one wife. So either Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene, and thus, he cannot marry the church, or he's married to Mary Magdalene, he marries the church, but he can't be the head bishop of his church. So none of that makes sense. So th then there are the people who say that Mary Magdalene was the harlot that came to Jesus and anointed his feet with oil, anointed his head and everything like that. Uh, the Bible doesn't say anything about that either. Uh, what it says about Mary Magdalene was, what? Who can tell me? She was possessed with seven chakras. <laughs> That's what I call them. Seven devils. She was possessed with seven devils. Jesus freed her from that. So here's this woman that has been made free now from these devils. I sort of believe that she had these devils be probably because uh, in her previous life before her of the occult. And tor tormenting her, torturing her, and so on. But anyway, it's Mary Magdalene at the sepulcher first. And anytime you have the Bible, she's... Or a harlot church, a harlot woman. Mary Magdalene, in this case, represents the true church. She seeks Christ. In that dark, she goes to the sepulcher. See if the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Remember, we identified that as John. And saith unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher. And we know not where they have laid him. Now remember, from uh, what we've read and from the other Gospels, we know that once they rolled that stone in front of uh, the tomb of Christ, then they sealed it.
probably with some form of uh, maybe sealing wax or something like that, but some form of seal was placed on that uh, stone so that if that stone had been moved, that seal would have been broken. And um, then they would know that somebody has tampered with that stone and tampered maybe with the contents of that sepulcher. And so when Mary gets there, she sees that, that it's been rolled away, seal's been broken, everything else, and she knows that something's gone wrong. Jesus is not in there, and she is panicking. It says they've taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher. We know not where they have laid him. In other words, she thinks that he's still dead, and they took his body and laid it somewhere else. Peter, therefore, verse 3, went forth, and that other disciple, there he is again, I'm the other guy. Okay, I could picture John wearing a t-shirt saying, I'm the other disciple. And came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together. And the other disciple did outrun Peter. I didn't know it was a contest. And came first to the sepulcher. And he stooping down and looking in saw... The linen cloth lying, yet went he not in. I read that wrong, didn't I? It wasn't a linen cloth. It was linen clothes. Remember, back in verse... Let's see here. What verse of uh, 19 did we see that in? 40, thank you. They took the body of Jesus wound and wound it in linen clothes. Mummy, like a mummy. They wrapped it around him like so. They wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of Jews is to bury. So we see these linen clothes laying there. So it could not have been this. Okay, and I'll, we'll get to that in a minute. It could not have been that. Uh, so verse 6 now. Then come to Simon Peter, following him, and went into the river, and see at the linen cloth. And, now we're going to add to it, and the napkin that was about his head. Not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Now, again, I would ask the question, why do you think that the Bible, and remember, the Bible comes from God's ma mind, God's mouth. These are the words of God, not, the, not just the testimony of John. These are the words of God. Why do you think that the Bible is going to so much detail about these linen cloths, about how Jesus was wrapped, how his body was wrapped, and how his head was wrapped, and how when they look in there, they see the linen clothes over here, but they see that what wrapped his head folded neatly and going out of its way to give you the, probably because of this. Because of that, um, I believe, for knowing what was to what was to come what was going to be brought out now i have no idea who that is but i know it's not jesus because the bible's description of the linen clothes do not fit again the um the shroud of turin and it's called that because it resides in a catholic church in turin italy and um, the Shroud of Turin is a single long piece of linen that shows a, a photographic image of both the back and the front of a man. Um, there is no doubt that it's the image of a man. There is no doubt that it's a photographic negative because what you're looking at now is the negative made positive, okay? Uh, and that 
when, when whoever figured that out first saw that, they just went, oh my goodness. And then uh, over the years, scientists have applied computer imaging technology to this image and have made it a 3D image, including uh, making for us an image of what that face looked like when whoever this person is was alive, when they had their eyes open. Um, but there are, some, there are some interesting things. And I think all along, whoever made this had it as an intention to make it look like it was the body of someone who, number one, had a crown of thorns uh, driven into his head. There are blood splotches up here on the crown of his head. Someone who had been scourged because there are scourge marks, all these little marks here, all these marks there, uh, here, there's blood dripping down here, blood here. Uh, it indicates that this man had been scourged with some form of uh, maybe a cat of nine tails that the Roman soldiers used or whatever. There are uh, spots here on this hand with blood coming out of it, indicating possibly the place where the nail was driven. Um, his loins covered with both of his hands, how convenient. Um, and so on. Uh, he has a beard. He has a mustache. He has long Jesus hair. Uh, the way everybody pictures Jesus. He has all the attributes and the looks of somebody, but it's not Jesus. I, I don't believe that it could be simply because the Bible's description of the way the clothes were originally wrapped around him, wound about him first, and then now they are wrapped together and the, um, the, the napkin that was over, there was a separate covering over his head and with the shroud here, you don't have a second covering. Also, uh, as I mentioned last Sunday, if you just take... Uh, Jenny, you can do this to Steve later. Just paint his whole body in paint and cover it, put a sheet over the top of him and then lift the sheet up. Okay? Post it on Facebook. It won't be recognizable as Steve. Thank God won't be recognizable because it's going to be a distorted image. The way cloth lays on somebody, you're getting their whole face down here and it just, it wouldn't work out. Uh, there is speculation. I saw one guy demonstrate how it could be possibly done in... ...was you. Da Vinci you thing exactly how it's done. But anyway, the light coming off, reflecting off of this sculpted image of the body being transformed to this linen, just like a uh, shutter opening up on the camera and allowing light to hit the, the chemicals that are on that film. Those, those, that, those chemicals are made to react to light and so on and so on. So it was possible that it could have been done about five, six hundred years ago, things like that. But I just, again, with the testimony of scriptures, I don't believe it was Jesus. Uh, secondly, here's the biggest reason why I don't believe it is Jesus. Because it is worshipped. It is. It is worshipped by the people who are told that any image of Jesus or Mary or Joseph or anything like that should be worshipped. Should be, they call it venerated. Okay, look up the word venerate. 
In fact, uh, well, it may, I may have it in there. Let me uh, get my Webster's 1828 dictionary out uh, using our pure Bible search software. Let me look up the word venerate here. Venerate. To regard with respect and reverence. To reverence, to revere. We venerate parents and elders. We venerate men consecrated to sacred offices. We venerate old age or gray hairs. We venerate or ought to venerate the gospel and its precepts. Uh, and seem to venerate the sacred shade. Let's see here. If you, I think it's etymology online gives you the idea that it, it it has more than just respect and reverence. It's worship. Okay? But I'll leave that and we'll go back to this here. All right. So the fact that it's worshipped. Uh, number three, I don't need it. Now, I was about 12 or 13, 14, somewhere around in there when I first heard about the shroud. And I read a, I read a book that somebody in the church had about it. Or maybe I got it from the school library or something like that. I don't know. But that fascinated me. And I thought, oh boy, this is it, man. This is finally going to prove to everybody that Jesus is real and he rose from the dead and, and, and so on and so on. And it's kind of like what Abraham told the rich man. They have Moses and the prophets. If they won't believe the word of God, if they won't believe the testimony of the scriptures, what makes you think they're going to believe a photograph or a painting or a statue? What makes you think they're going to believe in some miracle or something like that? Jesus said, an, an evil uh, and a, an adulterous generation always seeketh after a sign. They're looking for signs and wonders. And when they see that, they go, oh yeah, that's it, man. That's going to prove to everybody that Jesus is real. If they won't believe his own testimony, the word of God, what good does it do to have a religion where you choose where you choose the signs and wonders over the word of God what good does it do and so i don't need this or any other i don't if they there's some place there's a piece of splinter wood about this long in some catholic church in europe or italy somewhere and they say this came directly from the cross of Jesus Christ. And they come and they worship that. I think there's a Catholic church that's got a nail. And they say it's one of the nails that have driven through the hand. Who cares? I don't need it. I believe the word of God. I believe the Bible. That's, where I, that's the foundation of my faith. That's the source of my faith. And that's going to end up being the end of my faith. It's going to carry me through from this life to the next and I just believe the word of God so I don't need these gimmicks uh, and I promise you a lot of money is brought in when this thing is brought out guarantee you it is okay now um, let's see here let me get my head straight here uh, back to oh yeah uh, the beginning of chapter 20, uh, let me find the verse here. Um, okay, look at verse, let me go back here and see if I had that in my notes. Yeah, look at verse 8 here. Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher and he saw and believed. Now, verse 9 says this. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. Now, you kind of have to see that verse in the context, not only of place in the Bible, but of other scriptures as well. Because the question is, did they actually, were they actually told by Jesus himself? That he was going to rise from the dead on the third day. Yes, they were. But to the extent that they believed it in their heart, 
They didn't. Let me show you the evidence of that. Let me get past this. Matthew 17, 22. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them. I mean, there's Jesus with 12 disciples. They're sitting around and Jesus looking them all right in the eye. And he says, the son of man shall be betrayed into the hands of men. And they shall kill him. And the third day, he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry. Why were they sorry? Apparently, as soon as he said, and they shall kill him, apparently they stopped listening. As he said, well, the third day he shall be raised again. Now, I would say that. Because I would be like the other disciples, probably. I would be like, what, they're going to kill him? And like Jesus, like, I said I'm going to be raised again. They're going to kill you. Okay? It just went, boom, like an airplane right over their head. And they were exceeding sorry. They didn't rejoice over the fact that he shall be raised again. And they'd be going, oh my goodness, what a day that's going to be. Hosea chapter 6. This, this, this also is part of the prophecy. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. And it's like the, what Jesus did at the cross and then later rising from the dead, leaving the tomb... Um, is itself a promise and a prophesy, uh, prophecy to the people of Israel that in the third day, God will raise them up again. Remember, they're dry bones in the valley. And we shall live in his sight. They know that Hosea is telling them that you're going to die. You're going to be like you were not a people at all. But then God will raise you back up. He will revive you. He'll do it on the third day. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning. And he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain unto the earth. In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus says this. To, again, to his disciples. He's going to tell it to them flat out. Jesus going up to Jerusalem took the twelve disciples apart in the way. And said unto them, Behold. We go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. They were told. They were told. But... As with any prophecy, it's always best understood after it happens. I can tell you that there are some things that I read in Scripture, events that I believe are going to happen, that to me, I just... I don't get it. I don't understand it. I don't know exactly how that's going to play, how that's going to be done. Like uh, the, the meaning behind the iron kingdom mingling with the, uh, the clay. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. So I believe the event. I believe what's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know by what means they are going to mingle themselves with the seed of men. I just know that it's going to happen. And I think, like we were, like I was preaching this morning, the idea that um, God doesn't always just open our eyes up to everything that's going to happen to us in the future so that we know the entire outcome of our lives. I mean, it's probably all written right here. And we understand it after things have happened to us. We go to scripture and go, that's probably, that's why that happened. That's why God did that to me. Or that's why I did this or whatever. Um, but to understand it 
beforehand is difficult. We just... We just are we, are, we are seeing through a glass darkly, my friends, trying to see into the future. But once it happens, we go, ah, oh, that's what he told us. Uh, Luke chapter 13, look at this, how he says it here. He says, the same day there came certain of the Pharisees saying unto him, get thee out and depart hence. For Herod will kill thee. And he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow. And the third day I shall be perfected. So you go tell that fox. In other words, Jesus didn't say anything like, Tell Herod, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to make him mad. I don't, I don't want him to kill me. So just tell, tell Herod that I'm sorry and I won't say this stuff ever again. No. Tell Herod, you go tell that fox that I'm going to cast out devils, I'm going to do cures and nobody can stop me and the third day I'm going to be perfected and they can't stop that one either. Psalm 1610, here's one of the prophecies from the Old Testament. For thou will not leave my soul in hell Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So that right there, uh, in uh, if we were if we were applying a, a verse from the old to show us what was going to happen to Christ, that one fits. Uh, so verse nine again of chapter twenty: For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. But right here, Psalm sixteen and ten says it: He's not going to leave my soul in hell. He's not going to let thy holy one to see corruption and so what we believe is that when on the third day uh, Jesus rises from the dead he does look like I'm not dead or what's the zombie series on uh, huh the walking dead he doesn't look like walking dead you know with his eyes all punched out and whatever he doesn't look like that he he's basically intact uh, he doesn't smell he has not wilted in any way and the processes of bodily corruption have not taken away one thing from his physical body he looks alive he doesn't look dead anymore okay um, I've, I've seen people in both states naturally I've seen people alive I've seen people dead too before all the makeups put on before they all m make them look nice and try to give them some sense of life in their features I've seen people like that and you don't have to recognize somebody that's dead you can just tell that they're dead but that didn't happen to Jesus in that tomb at all because God would not suffer Jesus' body to see corruption. He would not suffer, he would not allow that to happen. Um, now, in uh, verse 11, Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. And seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had, past tense, lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord. And I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus, yeah, like this, okay? She saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. How could she not know that? He didn't change his appearance, did he? No, we don't have any evidence of that. How did she not recognize him? Anybody want to take a guess? Yes. Okay, I see what you mean. Huh? Um, we don't know if his hair was white at this point. 
We know it was white by the time we get to the book of Revelation. Huh? Yeah, here's what I think. I think that as with all of us, Jesus has to open our eyes. Okay? And you, you've heard my story about me sitting in my office one day and I'm thinking. I'm meditating on scriptures. And I'm just in the process of my mind. God leads me to a point where I believe he said, Mike, you know that this Bible is true in everything that it says. And there's not one mistake in it. And Steve, at that, at that exact second, I believed it. I believed it just instantly. With no proof, no evidence, nothing. I believed it. And that literally changed my life. And I mean, it wasn't that I, you know, was some blasphemer of God and, and everything else. It's just that I'd gone to the Bible colleges and they all told me there was mistakes in all the Bibles and all this and that and the other. And that's what was in my mind. But God, God led me down a path where God finally said to me, it is, let there be light. Let there be light. And once, once he said that, the light came on. And God has done that with every one of us, or you, you're not saved. God has said to you, let there be light. And he turned the light on for you in your heart, for you to see scripture, understand scripture, know that you were on your way to hell, know why, because it was your own sins, and know that Jesus died to take those sins away from you. That light came on to me when I was nine years old. Don't doubt some of these children when they say, I think Jesus lives in my heart now. I believe God can turn their light on. And when he does, it's on. Amen? It is on. So I kind of think that's what happened here. That she doesn't immediately have her light turned on yet. She knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, again now, she still... She's supposing him to be the gardener. Maybe because he had a rake in one hand and a spade in another. I don't know. But saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Okay. Let's see, that was verse 15. I'm missing some verses here. Uh-oh. Verse 16. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. That's all he said. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. She now, she knows. Now she knows. Jesus called her name, Mary. And it's like she woke up from a dream. Mary. Jesus saith unto her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene, verse 18, came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Now, did the disciples all believe her? Well, I don't know. Because apparently they tarry all day long until we get verse 19. And now it's evening. And they're not out looking for him. He's got to show up to them. Okay, so maybe they didn't just believe her automatically when she said it. But eventually they're going to. Now something that I didn't point out here, but I'm going to point this out very quickly and then we're going to dismiss. Uh, back at verse 1, the first day of the week cometh. And then again, when we look at verse 19, then the same day at evening being the first day 
of the week. Okay, just believe what the Bible says and be careful about what you read uh, on the internet. There's always somebody who's trying to mess around with uh, the day of Jesus' resurrection, especially Seventh-day Adventist people and um, uh, Sabbath keepers, sacred name people and so on. They, they try to establish Christ's resurrection on the Sabbath day instead of the first day of the week. But what does, uh, if you can remember some of the numbers that I've taught you, the number seven is a number for completion. What is the number eight for? Huh? New beginnings. So why not him being resurrected on the eighth day being the day of new life, new hope, new beginnings, a new start. That just makes more sense to me. They see this, the seventh day people and the Hebrew roots people and sacred name people because they've believed this lie that, they, that you can keep the law and, ma and make God happy. God's only happy with us because we go to church on Saturday. He only likes us and he doesn't like you guys because you go to church on Sunday. You worship the sun God. Okay, well you worship Saturn on Saturday then. That's what it that's where Saturday comes from, Saturn. Uh, but they're messed up. They try to fix the resurrection on the seventh day. That's not that's not what you read here, was it? It was on the first day of the week. And every gospel is in perfect alignment with that statement. The first day of the week, very early in the morning, first day of the week is when it happened. Amen. Amen. Today's first day of the week. It's been a good day. Amen. Let's stand to our feet.